am I so amazed that you always hang on to old things? You don't get rid of them. I had this blind panic. I couldn't get my foot down. I couldn't do anything. I just went... Whenever I pulled the brakes on, she'd headbutt me in the back. The mobilettes had gone. It would disappear from the back garden. Way back in 1975, I bought this little one-year-old moped. My sisters and I used him for many years. And when we'd moved on to cars, my dad dismantled Moby and put him up in the attic. Then, in 2015, friends Mike and Chris started dismantling Moby, ready to get him back on the road. Back in the 1970s, we were living just outside the city of Lincoln. And with only a push bike for transport, I needed something quicker. Luckily, Mum and Dad thought this was a good idea too. We always thought that it was essential because you needed to get around and at that time the moped solved the problem and that's how it came into our possession in around about 1975-76. I have a figure of £75 in my head but it may not be that. It wasn't very much anyway and it was about a year old I think when we had it. After me, my older sister Anne next took charge of this little machine. And despite the tiny size, she used Moby to transport her younger daughter, Julie, to school. So I think it was 78 I had it. And then we moved, and that's when I had Julie on the back. Tracy was at school already then, and Julie was with me at the nursery. Well, first of all, I wanted her on the back, and didn't know whether it was legal. So I went to the police station, and they said it absolutely was, as long as she had her feet in stirrups. So we bought a common or garden bike seat and had it fitted on the back. She had a blue helmet and it had a peak on it. <laughs> Whenever I pulled the brakes on, she'd headbutt me in the back. And even at nursery, when I used to get her dressed up with a hat on, helmet on, she'd walk around like this. Then my little sister, Jill, who'd been using it to go to school, moved to London for work and took him with her. But one night, the worst thing happened. This bike seems to just appear, you know. It was in the garage one minute and then I had it. There was some time when I think I was in sixth form and I can remember putting my cookery on the back in a basket. I was probably 16, something like that, maybe a little bit older. But I also had time with the mobile that took it to London when I worked in uh, Totteridge. I had just started being a nanny, so I was about 19. But it was just for me to tootle over to see my boyfriend of that time who was living in Hendon. I was going to see mum and dad, uh, but I did go to see Andrew the night before and left the mobilette in the back garden of his house. And then on the, the Sunday evening, I was ready to come back and Andrew called to say the mobilettes had gone. It would disappear from the back garden. With a heavy heart, caught the train back to London. What we did do was we went scouting around the sort of local area in desperation, trying to look for this bike. And we found ourselves walking into a very sort of smelly, dark underground car park. We found a garage door which was half open. We could see the number plate of the mobilette sticking out and there was nobody around because I was quite scared at this point because it was a horrible area. <laughs> we managed to lift the garage door and we literally just wheeled the bike out. It was quite incredible to have found it. We didn't involve the police, we didn't make any calls. We, it was probably a, about 100 yards away from where his house was. So glad to have it back. To see that number plate sticking out from that door. So there you go. So Jill and Andrew saved Moby from the evil bike thieves of Hendon. With a bit of clever searching. I love Moby, but he did have some peculiarities. One of the things this little thing had is that occasionally, if you open the throttle, the, the throttle would stick wide open and you, you, couldn't, you couldn't turn it off. It was just max. I must have stopped the bike and of course it wouldn't start because it just flooded every time. But I managed to jiggle it so that the throttle would shut then. And, but it, it, it was a rare occurrence, you know. I mean, averagely, once we got used to it, you knew its nuances, its silly little things yeah. that it did, and, yeah. and, and, you, and it just always went, you know? Yeah, it did, yeah. 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 After a while, it got choked up, but it was simple. It, it was about four bolts holding the engine in, and two <laughs> bolts holding the top of the engine. As long as you had a gasket, you just whip it off and scrape the carbon off and put it back together again. It was the simplest thing on earth. Easy to fix our little French beastie, but somewhat lacking in grunt. Yeah, there was one comedy moment of going up Lindham Hill in Lincoln, which was like that, then having to pedal it to give it a bit of extra 
oomph because it couldn't make it. Thank God for the pedals, as he only had a 50cc engine. Now, ice can be a problem on a bike, but on this occasion, Anne and Julie were not badly hurt. Julie also remembers us coming off on the ice and um, the back end went and somehow we were laying in the middle of the road and I don't remember, I think she was still in the seat because I had reins on her as well, attached to the, strapped on to the side of the seat. But that hill, later on, when she was going to school on her own bike, she used to set off a few minutes before me and then I'd set off and I'd hold her hand and drag her up the hill, which again I think was pretty illegal. And, and I think I had it up until, well, into the 80s. Moby makes it through a decade of use with Jill and Anne and is about to be mothballed. But I must tell you about when he made me look a complete idiot in front of a group of friends. Because it was my first real wheels, my first real transport, I had a friend, Dave Cotton. I'd go over to see him on a fairly regular basis. His father owned a precast concrete works. It was great for us as kids because we could drive cars around there without any licenses. It didn't matter, it was a big space, uh, but it was a long sort of gravelly drive up to the bungalow where Dave lived. And we're talking about the 70s here now, so I have probably not, <laughs> not much shorter than these because these are about 20 years out of date. <laughs> and as you can see, the silvery shiny bit, that's the, uh, the clutch. And there's a gap between the centre and the outer bit. And they, they do actually spin independently. You know, the, the, the idea is that one bit engages the other. That's how the drive works on it. So I'm zooming up Dave's drive. As I remember, there was more than one person waiting. They were all standing in the, near the drive. So I come zooming up the drive, big clouds of dust <laughs> coming from behind me. And as I approach Dave, and Dave is sort of acknowledging that I've just arrived, my left trouser bottom oh. caught in between the gap on the clutch and it, it stalled the engine which which to me I thought well that's not a problem I'll just cruise to a halt you know and as I actually hit the point where the bike stopped I went to put my left foot down which of course was now trapped in the mechanism All the fault of the <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. you had that ridiculous situation where I had this blind panic. I couldn't get my foot down. I couldn't do anything. I just went Eek! I fell over. And I do remember many years of uh, you know whizzing everywhere on it. And like most kids, I eventually got to the point where I wanted something bigger, and I went for a Yamaha FS1e. I'm sorry, there's nothing that is as iconic as this. It's retro. It's retro. Yeah. So after Jill, Anne and I had used Moby for a while, we all moved on to cars. But my brilliant dad decided to salt him away to be reborn. There it lived in the garage and I think I fiddled about with it. And it stayed there, I think in a sort of a dormant condition, until we then knew that we were going to uh, move to here. I dismantled the thing completely and put it up into the roof. I'm so amazed that you always hang on to old things, you don't get rid of them. I mean, you could have had a new one. Yeah. Yeah, but that's not the point, is it? No. The point but is... How many times has Mum said, get rid of it? Many, yeah, many times. Three-year guarantee, George. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, I've had to fight this battle yes. for now for all the time that we've been yes. here. Because it took up space, it was getting dusty, mm. why did we need it? And I, all along, in the back of my head, I think, well, we've had it for so long, it has a family history, it's a pity it doesn't go. And then John volunteered to restore it, which he's done, and I, and I think he's done a magnificent job. Yes. What can you say? It's fantastic. A huge thank you to my lovely mum who sadly left us in 2020, to my dad who made sure Moby would live to fight another day, to Mike Lawrence and Chris Wardman, Ace Dismantlers, and to Dave Rhodes for his help and inspired camera work. Most of this video was shot in 2015 and now we have moved house. Now I just need to find him again. <laughs>